Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land we're on is the traditional land of the Dakota people. Welcome to the Weisman Museum, to Pablo's talk. I'm Boris Ackerman. I work here as a curator for collaboration. Um, this is a two-part event, so there will be a talk. Um, we will take three questions right after the talk, but then there will be break, and then there will be conversation with Sam Gold and me and Pablo. And then you will have a chance to ask more questions. Um, I would like to thank the following people and organizations for their financial support. The voters of Minnesota for supporting the operational budget of this museum through the Minnesota State Art Board. The Wells Fargo Foundation Minnesota also for supporting the operational budget. Uh, Department of Art, Department of Chicano Lentida Studies, the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs, and the Office for Equity and Diversity of the University of Minnesota for co-sponsoring Pablo's visit. The Target Foundation for funding the construction of the Target Studio for Creative Collaboration that I curate. And Cindy and Jay Illenfeld for the endowment that makes my position here possible. And huge thank you to the Weisman Museum staff for making this event possible. Um, thank you, Pablo, for coming all the way. Uh, Pablo is an artist, an educator, event organizer, and writer. Uh, his practice spans history, pedagogy, social linguistics, ethnography, memory, and the role of contemporary culture in global reality. Uh, he has an active art practice in installation, sculpture, photography, drawing, socially engaged art, and performance. Um, now, if you go on his website, the bio is very long. I try to summarize it. Otherwise, it's going to take too long. So, some numbers. One of his projects, School of Pan American Unrest, uh, covered 20,000 miles crossing the continent from Alaska to Argentina with 40 stops in between, making, in, making it one of the biggest art, uh, public art projects ever. Uh, he published 24 books, presented and curated in countless venues and biennales. Um, since 1991, he worked in many museums, including Guggenheim and MoMA, New York, where he is now. He organized about 2,000 events in conjunctions with more than 100 shows. He received many awards, including Guggenheim and Creative Capital. And the list goes, goes on and on and on. <laughs> now, I have one personal thank you for you. Um, the quote that you see here on the screen is from the book Education for Socially Engaged Art. And that book made a lot of coins drop in my head when I first read it. There are good books about socially engaged art that tell you about theoretical perspectives, historical perspectives. Um, this book is unique uh, for its practicality. It actually, as it claims, it is a practical toolbox for artists written in practical language by practicing artists. So I first found this book when I was doing my MFA studies about two years ago. And I was applying for jobs at the same time. Um, so, as it happens, this passage pretty much summarizes the content of my letter of intent that I sent to this museum and of the presentation that I gave later on in my interview. Uh, social engaged art functions by attaching itself to subjects and problems that normally belong to other disciplines, moving them temporarily in a sp into the space of ambiguity. Um, now, in practice, attaching means that there is a person, an artist, working with another person who works in another discipline. So attaching means collaborating in practice. Uh, social engagement is a practice of collaboration. I believe that the opposite is true as well. Any collaboration is the practice of social engagement, whether it happens in the neighborhood or in the university or in the corporation. So um, when we're developing a program of collaboration, I believe we must think about this program as a program of social engagement. So this is what I proposed to this museum. Apparently it worked. I got the job. And thank you very much for helping me to get this job. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, Boris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I look forward to our conversation also with Sam Gold, a very good and dear friend. Um, as um, <clears throat> 
as uh, Maurice mentioned, uh, I will speak about ambiguity. I will speak about collaboration. Um, and um, I will try to explain what I meant by this paragraph. Um, I do feel, as artists, that we create, or we aim to create at least, um, spaces and uh, situations that allow us to question aspects about our reality. Whether we call that art or not, it's a different matter. But uh, it's definitely an aim of a whole generation and previous generations of artists to create a parenthesis within which we can um, reflect about ourselves, about the, the world we live in. And um, I will speak about the instances in which I have found myself to um, uh, do, do, trying to do those things. Um, I'll speak about my interest in people, in sociology, in displacement, in education, um, human interaction, memory and history, uh, culture and mobility. Those are the things that drive my thinking most of the times. I uh, always start with what will be the last artwork in my life, <clears throat> which is this one. Um, it's a piece titled Vita del Regula, which is Latin for Rules of Life. It's a work that consists in a game that lasts for the entire lifetime of its participants. Uh, it was initiated in March of 2013. Um, half of the participants are individuals that I know intimately and that are younger than me, so they're likely to survive me in the course of my lifetime and their lifetimes. The other half were perfect strangers that I uh, met the day of a particular opening in an exhibition in Italy where this project was launched. Each individual received um, uh, 16 letters, um, envelopes with um, instructions in them. Each envelope was um, dated on a particular time when it should be opened. The first envelope was meant to be opened the day of the opening, the second two days later, the third four days later, the next eight days later, 16, 32, 64, and so on. Between the time of each envelope, um, which was a few days, it would later extend to uh, months, weeks, months, years, and finally decades. And um, it is likely that I will, well, it's certain that I will not make it to the opening of the last envelope, which is in 2097, nor I'm afraid any of us. <laughs> My daughter, in fact, who is one of the participants who was um, four years old at the time of its opening, will be in her 90s by the time this envelope uh, opens. There's also an envelope that is meant to be opened on the date of my passing. And um, to me, uh, this is a social practice project, um, but it's also a project that directly engages with the life of the museum as an exhibition space. Uh, social practice has always contended with that impossibility of existing in a, uh, in a, in a, let's say, conventional exhibition space, such as a museum. And this, this piece was meant to be a narrative project, let's say, that specifically was dedicated to uh, individual experiences from people, by people, and responding to those messages that I had written for them back in, in 2013. So uh, again, you know, it, it's, it's a project about human relationships, it's about uh, history, and it's about the way in which we as artists are dialoguing with a uncertain or unknown participant. Many times, and because I am someone who has worked in museums for most of my adult life, I have stared at a painting made, or an artwork made 100 years ago or more, and wondered what the artist must have thought, could have thought about the idea that that artwork would eventually, 100 years from then, would make it into a gallery and impact the life and the sensibility of, of an individual like me. Um, that, that impossibility of really connecting with that past, with that artist who is gone, but the work is still there. Those, those are things that, to me, are particularly of interest. But I, I am interested in creating um, situations of displacement. And, 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 and ambiguity is, is a, plays a role in that, because displacement is, is the situation under which you are not sure where you're standing. And uh, I find that in those instances, 
are those when we ask ourselves aspects about our reality, as I mentioned. What you see here is an Ames room. Uh, if you are familiar with psychology, Ames was a, uh, a psychologist that, that came up with this idea of creating a room that is really distorted uh, and uh, in such a way that um, what, the, 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 the right side of the room is actually very, uh, is raised and the part of the, on the left is, is, um, is, is really um, below the, the, the top. So that when you stand on the back, you are very small and the, the person on the front um, or on the other side looks gigantic, but it's all an optical illusion. Simply, we don't see the, the, the real architecture of the space. And for that project, I did this uh, abstraction of a play by Mario Benedetti called Peter and, and, and the Captain, Pedro y el Capitan. Um, that is really uh, a play about the dictatorship in South America and uh, the military dictatorship. And, and uh, it, it's, a, it's an interrogation scene where a student that's been interrogated turns the tables on a military, military man who eventually becomes interrogated. Um, so um, I feel that art making sometimes helps us by, 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 by unbalancing those relationships between the viewer and the artist. Sometimes uh, inviting the viewer to become the artist. Sometimes by inviting the, the non-author to become the author. And sometimes by re relinquishing the, the authorship itself. Um, and that's something that has always fascinated me, um, how authorship brings identity, and how the perception of the authorship also, uh, the, the, the projection that we have on a particular artist uh, matters. Um, one of the first exhibitions, uh, solo exhibitions in, in Mexico City when I was in my 20s, um, uh, stemmed from this reflection that um, I was expected by some people to have a style or a particular approach. People were telling me, well, you need to develop your personal style. And, uh, and I thought that it would be interesting to basically have, to inhabit different identities of different people. I thought, what if I was an, uh, an American artist who was obsessed with architecture and, uh, and maps named Matthew Ridge? Or what if I was an Argentinian gay artist who in the 60s decided to make games, Ramiro Yanez Virgen? Or what if I was a, an Egyptian woman who lived in London and made um, political artworks about plane crashes. Her name was Mariam Nancy Duch. So I decided to create all these artworks with all these biographies of these artists and simply presenting the exhibition to the public without anybody knowing that I was behind the creation of all these works. It was presented as a group show where I was one of the artists participating. It was essentially like creating a play where all these fictions took uh, place and uh, non, no, in no moment were we allowed to say that I had made all the artworks. And it was also multicultural fantasy. It was really a, an attempt to, to provoke the viewer to think about what does it mean to, uh, to, to, to be this kind of artist? What are, what are the kind of projections that I make if I know that this artist is a Japanese woman in her 90s who lived in the 19th century, for example, or more than it's just a Mexican artist who is making art in the 21st century? Um, so I, I, I'm very interested for that reason in fiction and the narratives that we create to ourselves to explain reality. Um, and I have done very simple and, and straightforward projects that are informed by my own interest in, in museum education, and this is an example of that. Um, a number of a, a, a couple of artist friends of mine had a little art alternative space that was very short-lived in Chinatown in New York City. And uh, they offered me to do a little project there. And um, the space was so small, it was not a little bigger than a walk-in closet. Um, and it was called Forever and Today. <clears throat> it kind of reminded me, uh, for those of you who might be familiar with New York City and Manhattan, uh, to uh, what uh, are typically very small uh, rooms uh, up into the streets that usually have a tarot reader, somebody that can read you, a, do a palm reading or read you the cards. And I thought that I would do a very cheap card reading for people. Uh, I invented my own cards. And again, being the museum educator that I am, I am very acutely aware that um, things change meaning when you, whenever you tell them something about it. In other words, if, if you see a stone on the floor, nobody cares about it, but if, you, if I told you that that's part of the moon, that will immediately change your, uh, your relationship, perhaps, with that object. Uh, so this was the, the case of this particular project where I would say this uh, image represents your childhood, or this image represents your love life, or your past, 
or all the things that worry you, or all the bad things, all the future, all the good things. And I am no um, um, a tarot uh, professional, uh, and uh, but I am an educator, and I'm I'm trained to ask questions. And um, what was really interesting to me was the the individuals that participated in this uh, in this process. In a way, um, they were. Um, participating in what is really kind of like an, a form of ancient therapy, knowing in a way what you want to hear, but needing of someone to help you guide through the process of gaining those insights. And, uh, and I've, been, I've been always very interested in how we can generate experiences that are of Im immersive nature and that are reflect self-reflective nature using the, the vocabulary and the, and the, and the con social conventions that are not necessarily related to art. But going back to memory, um, <clears throat> and because I work in museums, um, my, um, I, I feel um, it's important to, to produce uh, projects that um, reflect on the ironies of, of preservation and of memory. Um, this project called Conservatorio de Lenguas Muertas, Dead Language Conservatory, is a project that specifically deals with uh, the phenomenon of the dying languages in the world. Uh, these days, every two weeks or so, the last speaker of a language dies in the world. And uh, we will, within our lifetime, around half of the world's languages will be gone. And um, I wanted to um, make mention of this fact in a visual way, not by using the latest technology, but by using the earliest technology. So by producing these uh, wax cylinder records, which is really the earliest form of recording ever devised, I started interviewing individuals that were last speakers of different languages. <clears throat> the, the, the wax cylinder, which was invented by Thomas Alva Edison in the 19th century, if you might have might never seen one, it's, it's a very simple object. It's a wax object that has these grooves um, that really essentially functions the way that an LP record. You know, it's the, the vibrations of, of sound are recorded by a diamond needle that through, a, a, through a, these uh, hills and valleys that, that it, that it uh, creates in this surface that hardens with wax, uh, eventually becomes permanently inscribed. And uh, what I always found really uh, interesting was the idea that the sound was physical that it was not this digital, very difficult to grasp um, um, idea, but it was actually a physical object that the moment that it was broken, and these are things that are very fragile, it's gone forever. Um, and because I'm from Mexico, I, um, I decided to travel to the north of Mexico, which is where uh, some of the um, some, many la dying languages exist. Mexico is one of the countries in the world with the greatest language diversity, along with China and India. And uh, <clears throat> we have around maybe 60 languages still spoken. And there's, of course, languages like Nahuatl and Maya that are spoken by millions of people. But there's also languages that, for example, the Kumiai, which is spoken by this woman in the, in this, in the town of Tecate, which is not very far from the border from San Diego, um, which is just a handful of people that speak this language. Or this woman who is Kukapa, uh, which is from Sonora. And the Kukapas um, are just basically a few dozen people from a that that want, that speak a language that has a, a huge and rich array of stories, songs, and uh, uh, and, uh, and, and 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 tales of origin, things like that. I always uh, like to ask people to to imagine what it would be like for you to be the last speaker of your native language. What it would be like to be the last English speaker in the world, the last person that can understand a Beatles song, the last person that can really understand a Shakespeare sonnet. There's a kind of intimate knowledge that um, native, being a native speaker gives you that is practically, we believe, impossible to gain you if you don't have lived um, your life um, uh, living that, the, the nuances of that language. And, um, and so this project uh, tries to make mention of that phenomenon and, uh, and point at the perhaps inevitable ephemerality of, of, the, of, of culture. Um, I spoke about displacement and uh, language displacement and fiction and mobility uh, were the things that informed uh, these projects, the School of Pan-American Unrest. 
Uh, it was a project that was started in 2003, uh, just before the invasion of Iraq by the United States government, <clears throat> and um, which prompted in me the desire to understand foreign policy, United States foreign policy, uh, which led me to the notion of Pan-Americanism, uh, a notion that in the 19th century was very important for um, uh, the founding fathers like, like Thomas Jefferson. Um, <clears throat> and that it was also invoked by other uh, Latin American leaders like Simon Bolivar, imagining at some point a mythical uh, country that will be uh, all of the Americas together, which we know is an impossibility, I suppose. Um, but at that moment, uh, in the early 2000s, when the European Union was uh, such a, 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 like a powerful uh, seeming reality, um, I, I thought, I, I asked to myself, you know, what would it be like to just be one single country? You know, what does bring us, to, what brings us together culturally as Americans in the larger sense of the word? So I thought that the easier way to figure this out was to drive all the way from Alaska to Chile. It's not so easy, <laughs> so that you know. <laughs> um, but um, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be one guy with a van, a website, and a little schoolhouse, which was not so little. But uh, it was in the shape of a tent, and I, I just was able to collapse it to put it inside a van. And I drove uh, the entirety of the Pan American Highway asking these questions. The, the format, in fact, was deceptively simple. It was really uh, having a conversation with a host about possible topics that we could discuss once I, the school arrived to their town, identify a topic, um, collaborate with individuals, and um, and to make it function in, a, in this very autonomous uh, way, you know, being like a little cultural center uh, where different activities could take place. The workshops led to uh, what became known as the Pan American Addresses. There were uh, speeches that were collectively written by um, the participants of different workshops and that they came kind of manifestos of sorts of like what would the cultural, the artistic community of the particular city uh, saw as some of the opportunities and obstacles of the particular city where they lived, and what would they do about it? Uh, incidentally, in Portland, which is where I, had my, where I met some gold, and we're going to have a conversation about that, perhaps. Um, but at, there I was in Portland, Oregon. We also, um, um, I, I decided that the project would also have all the nationalistic, um, I would say, accessories of, 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 uh, of, of a nation, such an anthem, such as a uh, series of speeches. So there was like a, trying to inhabit the way in which a nationality and nationalism is expressed, but invoking in this case a, a fictional type of nationalism. It's a project that, that deeply changed my way of understanding of, of, of uh, art, my way of understanding communities, and, uh, and the role of the artist in, in, cre in creating and instigating um, opportunities and, and of, of dialogue and platforms of dialogue with others. So I cannot really sp speak too long about what, what this project was about, but I can only say that this continued in many different ways. An example was a similar project that I did in Italy that was not necessarily a mobile project, but it was um, a discursive project uh, in Bologna, the city of Bologna, consisting in creating a radio station for the city in collaboration with local artists and uh, cultural producers. It was titled Aelia Media, and it really consisted in, in working with individuals from that community of Bologna, that city of Bologna, to uh, choose the topics that they felt were important it, uh, and then put them on radio. Uh, the other thing was that in Bologna, that period, uh, it was really difficult for many artists to find a place where to show their work. Uh, it was undergoing a, a difficult moment uh, with a lack of artistic spaces. So in a way, we, we grabbed radio the airspace as a space where we could make art. And, uh, and that was just a possibility um, that I wanted to present to, to the public. Not being the expert on Bologna, I wanted to create a structure within which um, this could be possible. Um, and I'll just talk about one more project. I don't want to spend too much time here but, uh, doing all this. But um, <clears throat> I, I have spoken about mobility. I have spoken about memory and history. Uh, about individual interactions, about ambiguity, a displacement, and sociology. And this project, uh, which is one of the most recent projects I have done and continues to, to, to run, deals with all these aspects. Uh, it's called Libreria Donceles. I am a, uh, 
I'm a big book lover. I'm like a, a bibliophile. Um, I'm obsessed with books. And my house is packed with books, you know. Um, when I was uh, an art student in Mexico City, um, I didn't really have any money to, to go and, and, uh, and buy many things. And um, <clears throat> I would go to a place in downtown Mexico City that is known for selling old used books, which is known as the Calle Donceles. It's one of the oldest streets in Mexico. This is actually the street where the first printing press was brought into the Americas. It, it was, it, that was in the 1530s. And um, so incidentally, there, there it is, this uh, book, this uh, gigantic uh, strip of used bookstores uh, where um, you can be there for hours, where if you ask, do you have the latest book of such and such, they will completely ignore you. Uh, it will be impossible to find uh, anything specific. You have to be willing and ready to get lost forever in that forest of books. It's like going inside a mine for hours and hours. And then eventually you'll find that fascinating book for like five pesos, you know, that, that, you, that, will, that probably will be a, a great find. I, I thought, I was thrilled by that, by the idea of the chase of the book and the way that, that finding that cheap little um, object uh, would be um, very, um, kind of like a meaningful experience personally for me because I was the one who had found it. It had found me perhaps in a way. Uh, this um, has been always an interest of mine, as I said. And um, fast forward to 2013 in New York City, uh, where um, we have around 2 million Latino uh, residents in New York, which is approximately a, almost a fourth of the entire population. And there's not one single bookstore that sells books in Spanish. Um, the last, the only one bookstore that sold books in Spanish had closed uh, for, for good um, a few years ago. And I was deeply saddened by that fact. Uh, that aided to the fact that, as you know, in this moment in time where we, where we are basically getting rid of all paper products and, and, and transitioning to the e-economy, um, the, the object of the book is rapidly disappearing. Um, so I, I thought about a Mexican poet, Jose Juan Tablada, who was, in fact, the first um, uh, art critic of the modern era in Mexico, who happened to come to Mexico in the to New York in the 20s, and he had this great idea of opening a bookstore in Spanish uh, in 1923 uh, in the neighborhood of Chelsea. Now, Tablada was a fabulous poet and a great art critic, but he was a terrible businessman, and uh, so he failed and folded within you know, two months. So I had this idea that it would be great to fail like him, and and. Um, and I convinced a gallery that I worked with to turn their um, gallery into a failed business for two months. They said yes, um, which was surprising to me. I, at first, I thought it was impossible that it would happen, but I also never thought I would drive from Alaska to Chile. So here you have it. Um, so I went to Mexico City not really knowing exactly how to accumulate a whole bookstore worth of books. And, uh, and I had this idea that I would just give out some of my collages to people in exchange of books. At first, I got maybe like 10 books. And um, I, really, I thought, well, I don't think I have a bookstore with 10 books. Um, but I continued and continued promoting the project until finally I got uh, the, the interest of a reporter uh, that, that uh, wrote for La Jornada, which is a, a very important uh, daily in Mexico City. And then I had the opposite problem, uh, where everyone wanted to participate. Uh, I was getting calls from Puebla, from Veracruz, from all over the country. People mailing me boxes, people bringing me their childhood books, uh, secretaries, teachers, um, other artists. Uh, I ran out of collages. I couldn't give more collages, but people keep coming. It was it was similar to Mickey Mouse and the uh, and the Sorcerer's Apprentice dilemma, you know, where I was getting drowned in books, not knowing how to stop it. People. And then one thing about Mexico City, you know, if you are more or less middle class in Mexico City, you have lived in the same house for like 40 years, and you probably have an attic completely packed with stuff, including books. So it was very easy to people to cram their car with books that they wanted to get rid of and give them to me. And I, I, um, uh, I think the friends of uh, my friend, uh, the parents of my friend were not very happy with me after their house was flooded with books. And I, here I have to confess, you know, um, Kickstarter saved my life and social media, and it allowed, allowed me through fundraising to bring this to New York City. 
And in September of 2013, exactly five years ago, we opened Libreria Donceles. I, I, sort of, I sort of like put it together uh, with my own personal memories of Donceles and my own experiences in browsing old books in, in those in weird idiosyncratic stores uh, in different cities, including Chicago, where I went to school. I remembered how basically the, the owner, if you were inside like their house, and indeed, you know, I, after a while, I realized that I was, in a way, recreating my mother's apartment when I was basically putting all these books together. I, um, I should mention here that, you know, I am from a generation that is really um, one of the last analog generations. And uh, for me, the internet was this, you know, when I was growing up. This was, this was my access to the world, my window to the world. It was not um, anything I could really access through uh, a, a virtual interface. But the, book, the bookstore was really, uh, and is really, a what you would call, in Ray Oldenburg's terminology, a third space. Uh, a place that is not work, a place that is not home, but it's somewhere in between. It's the place that you go to, to find people that, that think like you, that, that feel like you, that, that relate to your own ideas. And, uh, and that's the place that, that I felt it was truly collaborative, the place where <clears throat> Individuals from, from different facets of the community came to the bookstore asking to do events, to use the space as a platform, to, to do book readings, to do poetry readings, to do book, book clubs, um, to do a variety of, of activities. And we had always an open door policy for, for running the space as essentially an open, platform, open mic cultural center. Um, the problem that I had, of course, at the end of this uh, two-month uh, period was that I had 20,000 books in my hands and I was in New York City. So that's not a good situation. Um, however, what happened was that other cities started calling me and told me, we would like the bookstore here and we'll ship it. Um, they will pay, it will be like moving to that, to that city, basically. So my life has been an ongoing string of movings you know, for every few months. This was in Phoenix, Arizona where uh, we arrived at a time of really heightened anti-immigrant uh, policies and sentiments by the Republican leadership. Uh, Joe Arpaio was then sheriff of Maricopa County. Uh, governor Jane Brewer was the, the governor. And there was the, the Phoenix, and still is, unfortunately, it's a place that you are you're detained uh, when, while driving, while Latino. You know? um, but uh, we, uh, for that reason, Donceles became a really important um, space for for uh, for people to to have a number of activities and 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 gatherings uh, discussing issues of ethnicity and, and culture. But mostly, like Donceles was always and has always been not a place where where big confrontations are erected. It's really a place that tries to show the the richness uh, that any language can contain. And I always say that this bookstore project can really happen in any language. It, it doesn't have to be in Spanish. You can do it in Swahili. You can do it in Hindi. You can do it in Mandarin. And what's really important about these uh, details is that, <clears throat> that, that knowledge is not culture specific. In other words, you can have a book of chemistry, but in Spanish, you can have a book of agriculture and, 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 and Heidegger translations of you know, being in time. And, and you can, of course, have Cervantes and have Carlos Fuentes and Octavio Paz and famous writers, Spanish uh, language writers, but you can also have Flaubert and you can have Dostoevsky in Spanish and, uh, and you can have Marxist theory and you can have, uh, the, the autobiography of Shirley MacLaine, which for some reason I received like 20 copies of that. <laughs> and they're still available if you're interested, you know. Um, and uh, very mysterious donations. I had like a donation of horror novels, which was you know, kind of really interesting. Um, I had a, almost any subject matter you can possibly imagine, you know, we, we had it. And um, one interesting aspect about Donceles was um, also that we, <clears throat> um, requested each individual to only choose one book um, because we did not want people to just hoar be hoarders and take everything away, um, but also with, because we wanted the relationship between the person and the book to be really, really special and your selection to be very, very special. Uh, at the same time, we made books pay what you wish. You could pay one cent or you could pay a million dollars. It didn't really matter. What, uh, what we did with the funds was to always redirect any 
uh, sales to a local organization that supported Latino culture. Uh, and, um, and so uh, that's how Don Celes has, has continued. You just saw images from San Francisco where it also traveled. We traveled to Seattle, we traveled to Indianapolis, to Chicago, to Boston, and, uh, and now presently we have just opened a bookstore in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, I thought a project, this project would last two months and it's been five years. Um, I've tried to end the project repeated times, um, but um, saying that I'm sick of moving. Um, but there's, there's a, a, an interesting reality about a, a project like this and for I think many social practice projects that one initiates, and it is that they become a thing of their own. You know, they, they become owned by others. You know, they're, even though you might have been the instigator or the person who maybe have proposed uh, the extravagant idea in the first place, in the end, it, it goes beyond you. You know, and, uh, and to me, that is maybe one of the most rewarding aspects of, of working in this capacity. Uh, for example, the, the, um, a group of artists who participated in the bookstore uh, project in Phoenix were incredibly saddened when we finally had to close. And they insisted that it was really important to them to have a bookstore. And they decided that they would create a bookstore on their own, a number of women artists. And I, I basically told them, you know, if you are able to do that, I will give you some of my books, you know, but I just can't stay in Phoenix forever. You know, <laughs> I can't move here, you know. And, um, and they did. So there's a bookstore in Phoenix called Palabras that opened directly inspired in Don Celes and, uh, and it still is operating at full capacity. And I, I, to me, that's one of the most gratifying um, aspects of working in this, in this form. So with that, I think I will stop. We'll take three questions and then we'll take a break. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have a microphone for uh, anyone who might want to ask a question. Uh, thanks very much for sharing so many interesting ideas. Uh, I'm wondering how this all, you talk about your life as an artist, which sounds very all-consuming, but you're also uh, a, um, in the art institution, employed, and I'm just wondering how, you, how do you juggle those things and do they, how do they feed off each other? Do they interrupt each other or how does that go? Um, thank you for the question. It's, it's always been a, a big dilemma for me. At first, I, I was very embarrassed to admit that I was an artist within the museum. It's like being a monkey that works in the zoo, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and I did have this Superman Clark, Clark Kent conflict, of like, you know, am I going to now change into my dirty clothes and be an artist? Um, uh, and uh, at first, I was, I was trying to maintain those two worlds completely separated. Um, and uh, the reality is that, um, in fact, I maintain them completely separate publicly. You know, they, they, when, I'm, when I'm in the museum, I never speak about my work. Whenever I am working, functioning as an artist, I don't start like becoming a representative of the museum. However, the two things influence one another completely. And, and whenever I'm within the institution, I'm thinking about the art process and, and the public in different ways. And, uh, and the other way around, when I'm an artist, I, I think about my responsibility to the community in, in ways that perhaps are not just self-serving or just completely egocentrical. Because working in a museum, what allows you to do, I believe, is, is to really get a sense of your public duties, that you are not, that the things are not just about you, that it, that it has to be, that you have to participate in a, in a democratic, in a civic dialogue with a community. And those things, I think, have been very valuable to me. And um, lastly, I mean, I think that the, the museum for anyone, um, not an artist, it, it's, it's really an incredible uh, public platform and a space where you can observe human behavior. Uh, I'm fascinated by how we experience art. And my job is, as, as an educator in museums is to help people experience art in a, in a meaningful and positive way. Um, but I feel that that process ha should be uh, much more, more like part of the, the artistic process. And, and that's why I think I started doing social practice before I 
that that term even existed, you know, like me and Sam and many others, you know, we, we just didn't know how to call it. We just knew that we needed to do some kind of activity that really went beyond the mere kind of, uh, kind of symbolic representation of things, uh, the symbolic participation, that we wanted participation to be real. We wanted participation to have a deep meaning and, and, to, and to have some kind of a memorable uh, outcome for whoever participated. Yes, back there. Thank you very much for all the different uh, examples of how to uh, be able to socially engage with art. Um, I'm curious about, well, I have many questions, but I'm just gonna ask one about one of the projects, which is El Conservatorio de las Lenguas Muertas. Um, I'm intrigued because there's this part about conservation of languages that is so tied to salvage anthropology, right? And there is this other aspect that goes along with it and that I don't know if it's part of the dialogue, which is, well, why are they disappearing, right? Um, so it is, is it about, I, 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 I get the, like, the respect for conserving, but what about the other side of the problem, which has to do with all the issues, colonialism, imperialism, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, uh, that have contributed to all that. Mm. Unfortunately, I'm just one person that has interest in the subject and make black cylinders, and I wish I could like sell, solve the problems <laughs> of the extinction of languages. And, I feel that the, the projects, the, the interest in my projects, uh, tries is lies in trying to restore an interest uh, and, and highlight the importance of something, and, and I feel that generating that consciousness is what is within my abilities to do. Uh, if I am successful and people start caring about the idea, then then maybe maybe something else could happen. Uh, so what is what is within my means is to basically to to provide visual representation uh, and experiencing of that issue, and uh, that is the case of Lenguas Muertas. It's the same case with with the books. It's a case with Pan Americanism. You know that then it invites you to reflect. You know what if we were more integrated? Uh, in the case of the that languages conservatory is really like. Uh, what are we doing what we need to really uh, preserve the local, the local cultures that we have in the places where we live? The realities that we contend with are gigantically and, and, and enormous. You know, uh, basically the fact that because of the, the quick migrations and fluidity of the world and the way that the world is connected, um, it, it seems like almost impossible to maintain the, the, the uniqueness of a particular language if everybody is moving to another country or, 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 or the English language or predominant languages like Mandarin or Spanish or English are taking over. Um, that, that is something that I don't have the answers to, but I feel what my contribution can be is simply to highlight the nature of this problem and, and generate or promote a certain kind of appreciation towards aspects of that issue. And I think that's well, one, well, one last question before we, uh, we're gonna take a break and then we'll go into conversation with, uh, with Sam and Boris. You mentioned that you, you, you like to challenge museums with inability to represent um, social engagement projects. Uh, and I wonder what is the value of, for you, of presenting the such projects to the museum? What is the value of presenting in a museum project like 40,000 miles uh, Pan American project? Well, in, in, the, in the case of, um, of the School of Pan American Unrest, my interest was not really showing in museums, um, simply because, you know, um, it was really not about status building. You know, it was, it was and, and, and really it was about going to places that I had never been before, you know, of which I did know, I know very little about the communities. And I think, I felt that the value of being in those places was not the kind of important institution that, that, that existed there, but the things that, that its people had to say. So for example, when I was in Ushuaia, which is what's known as the end of the world, you know, it's, the, uh, it's a city at the, at the tip of Argentina, uh, it doesn't really matter that you are in the National Museum of Ushuaia, you know, because, you know, you know who knows, you know, that museum, 
but it was really to hear from people who live there. You know, what, what is it like to live at the end of the world? You know, what is it like to wake up every morning? And then you, there you are, you're looking at, you know, the, the, the sea and, and knowing that you are at the very tip of the, of the south. What is it like to have that kind of light and, and, and what, what does it do to your sensibility? Speaking to artists that lived in those places was fascinating to me. So to me, it was essentially a human story. And I, and I saw my role at times as the one of a journalist. You know, and I had a blog. You know, in those times, this was before social media. You know, you had a blog, right? So I would blog every night um, my conversations with people. You know, but I was kind of like a like a journalist interviewing individuals, uh, and uh, and trying to report the, their stories as something that I that I felt was of value. So more than existing in a particular institution or museum was um, to really have a global conversation. And, and, have, and creating the conditions under which you know, someone who might be in Alaska will be reading about the stuff that was happening in Colombia and, uh, and people who were in Chile reading about the stuff that was happening in Mexicali and things like that. And the last thing I would say is that uh, the reason why I did that project, being already somebody who had worked in museums for so long, was precisely that I felt that this was precisely the project that a museum would never do. You know, this was a project that would never send nor have I ever heard a museum sending an artist across the globe to do a project, you know, uh, to, uh, to try to gather information, do this kind of uh, uh, crazy search or expedition. Uh, and I felt um, for that reason that I needed to create in a way my own little museum, my own institution, which was the School of Pan American Unrest, that uh, was as a vessel this, um, this project that would travel throughout the Americas. I think we'll take a break. How long do we have until we resume? 15 minutes. We'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll resume. Thank you so much.